Practice, practice, practice. We say that a lot. And we always say it three times when we say it. Are we just being annoying? Or could this be a matter of some importance? Or both? You're about to find out. You're listening to Music Student 101. Here are your hosts, Jeremy Burns and Matthew Scott Phillips. Hey, Matt. Hey, Jeremy. Knock, knock. Who's there? Bass player. Bass player who? It's a bass player with the pizza you ordered. <laughs> Ooh. Burn. <laughs> Another fine bass player joke from our friend Jay the Guitar Player. Nice. And we will talk about Jay the Guitar Player in a little bit because we have him to thank for this episode. Oh, excellent. Yeah, man. Um, a lot of times you've heard us say the phrase, practice, practice, practice. Mm-hmm. So for every time we say that, we say practice three times. At We've least. We've probably said that about a hundred times. <laughs> so as Sounds we- important. <laughs> Yeah, man, if, as we near our 100th episode, I mean, this is episode 83, but right. I'm starting to look back and re- review some of the more obvious things that we might have missed. Or getting nostalgic and... <laughs> that, too. I do <laughs> get nostalgic from time to time. But one of the things I don't think... We did an episode, I think it was episode six, about um, study habits. Yeah, that one was way back there. Way back there. But it was really more focused on... The learning process and how you know absorbing music theory and, and just good study habits in general. Right. Yeah. For a student preparing for your music theory test. Yeah. Exactly. And more in the collegiate atmosphere. But I think we need to broaden this out to really apply to just any musician who wants to know more about practice. Yeah. And how so- to how to devote your musical time in in a productive way. Hmm. Yeah. So. Um, Throughout my life, I cannot say I've been the authority on this. <laughs> well, who is? Who is? Well, there are some people who wrote some pretty good articles that we can at least draw from. Well, that's good. In this episode. But as I like to do, before we get into all that, we have a new review, we have a new Patreon patron, we have, um, and then a listener mail to discuss. Excellent. So shall we get right into it? Let's get into it. Okay. Um, first, we have a new review from our friend, Jason Larray Keener. Uh Uh-huh. Hello, Jason. Yeah, and Jason's come up not too long ago. Um, He lives actually here in Birmingham, and I work with him from time to time. Oh, excellent. And uh, as you recall, he did a composition for us on our first listener composition. I do. I do remember that. I I knew that name sounded (laughs) And do you remember that Jason LeRae Keener has, that's his kind of classical cinematic composing name, but he has three other alter egos. (laughs) So this is just Jason leaving the review. Jason, if you want to, you can come back and leave a review with the other three alter (laughs) egos. people and really fill it up for us. <laughs> but uh, I think that's really cool. Um, mm. Let's hear what old Jason has to say. He says, music theory can be very intimidating and confusing. Jeremy and Matt do an excellent job of translating centuries old concepts to a modern conversational dialogue. <laughs> the podcast is great by itself, but I suggest listening in tandem with the book, mm. using the book layout to structure your listening order. Mm-hmm. Interesting, huh? Yeah, um, I wonder which book he's using. Well, he's actually he's actually got himself a copy of Tonal Harmony by Stephen Koska and, Dor- and Dorothy Payne. Dorothy Payne, yes, yeah. and actually that's not a bad one to use because the order in which the theory lessons come out in this in this show are pretty roughly roughly fr- uh, sing- most on- theory textbooks do things in not exactly the same order, but a generally similar. Order. Yeah, yeah. You know. I go back and forth between tonal harmony and harmony in context. Right. Uh, Miguel Roy Francoli. Correct. There's another textbook by Alan Fort. Mm-hmm. This called Theory in Context or Tonal Harmony or, or Rule or something like that. <laughs> just just look up Alan Fort. Uh-huh. Uh huh. F O R T E. Yeah. Uh, Schachter has one. Uh, there 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 are a lot of there are a lot of them out there. Yeah, yeah. And, and they tend to. Um, they tend to follow an order. The pedagogy is kind of is pretty well established, mm-hmm. you know. So, so they so they tend to they tend to follow a general order. They don't do everything exactly the same. There, there's different focuses based on pedagogical philosophies and what have you. But 
Yeah. And you being a, co- a college professor, um, I often look to you for guidance as to what the next episode is going to be. I look to your <laughs> pedagogy to confirm that this is actually a good thing to do next in sequence. You know, yeah, and sometimes I, I kind of you know follow my own opinion mm-hmm. <laughs> in, in that regard. But that's okay. <laughs> uh, Jason continues, I tend to read a chapter in my music theory book, find myself really quite confused, and then listen to their episodes on the topic to clarify what the book couldn't communicate as well as them. <laughs> I've listened to most episodes more than once, comprehending more with each subsequent play. Get in the habit of listening to this podcast regularly, and you'll begin to find music theory more fascinating than frightening. Oh, well, I certainly hope so. Uh, uh, that That's our job. Our um, job and our goal. Yeah, clearly uh, we have experience with music theory textbooks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I say this a lot, but... it. it it's true. One of the main reasons we started this podcast is because textbooks like that can be very frightening. Yeah. You know, their language is complicated uh, and complex mm. and uh, dry, you know. No good BS side digressions. No good BS side digressions, you know. Not that no, you would want uh, in a theory textbook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no opportunity to ask for clarification. You know, the book is the book. And, you know, if, if you don't understand something, well... You know, you, you kind of just have to deal with it, I guess. And, you know, uh, music professors, theory professors spend a lot of time <laughs> <laughs> thinking about the textbook they like and why they like it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I thought you were going to say music professors spend a lot of time in their office wondering if anyone's going to come and ask questions. That too. <laughs> Uh, uh, that too. Uh, you know, I've, I've, yeah, in, in talking to my colleagues, you know, I've, I've run into all kinds of different, first of all, there's all kinds of different sort of just pedagogical ideas out there, right? You know, we, we, we all kind of have our things that we sort of think is important. Mm-hmm. Um, and we agree on large parts of it. And, and then the details is where we get, you know, bogged down sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there are people that will say, I, I've heard people say things like, do I like the approach of the textbook I'm using? Well, no, but I can overcome that in my lectures. Mm-hmm. It's like, yes, I'm using this book that is confusing, but I like these one or two or three things about it, and I can overcome the, the confusing things. You know? mm-hmm. And I've heard people who say, you know, this book just gives you the absolute wrong concept of what of what music theory is, and I don't want to use it. Yeah. You know, and you know, I've, I've known professors that... that you know, a, a great part of their effort in putting together class is finding the right book. You know, they want to find a book that they can teach from easily. Right. Right. And, and so there, there's there's a lot of, uh, of different ideas out there. Uh, uh, one thing is for sure, uh, I feel Jace's pain. Music theory textbooks are, are complicated, mm-hmm. you know. And, uh, yeah, part of our job is to make it less complicated, less frightening. Yeah. And I like his approach, Um Read the read the chapter first, and then and then check out the episode. Oh yeah, it, it's is is sort of analogous to reading a chapter and then coming to class, right? Read the chapter before you go into class, and then hear the lecture in class. And yes, it is. You know, so if you read the chapter and then listen to the episode and then come to class, you should be a rock star. Yeah, you really should. Well, you know, we're, you're kind of getting a theory education for free here. Yes, we said that, haven't we? <laughs> yes, oh. but not entirely for free because we do have a Patreon page if you if you decide to contribute. We do, and uh, perhaps that means we should move on to our Patreon patron. We have a new Patreon. Did you like page. that segue? How? Was proud of that was a great segue, yeah, okay. actually. Yeah. Very natural. <laughs> until just now. Until just now. Until we ruined <laughs> it by pointing out that it was a segue. Anyway. <laughs> Segway. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. Hey, we have a, Patre- a new Patreon patron, Ted Jones, mm-hmm. from Media, Pennsylvania, which is uh, just outside of Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ted says, well, first of all, Ted is an engineer. Yeah, another engineer on Patreon. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Uh, he first met us on a long drive home from South Carolina. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Searched for blues music theory and found our blues part one episode. Which is pretty far I, into I the show. I remember that. Yeah. yeah, which is pretty far into the show, yeah. <clears throat> uh, Ted says, I took organ lessons when I was a teenager, which was mostly my parents' decision. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, it wasn't against my will, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't recall initiating it. Sheet music options were limited since it was the dark ages of no internet. Ah, oh, we remember those. I do, I do. Uh, all I remember is Christmas carols, uh, which I liked, and soft rock options like Barry Manilow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, organ is an interesting thing. The organ's repertoire is huge, and 
um, self-sustaining and uh, doesn't – there's not a lot of crossover between organ and other things. That's a good you know? point. Yeah, it's a it's it's a it's an instrument that has a tradition all of its own. You know, mm-hmm. the tradition is as important as the instrument. You know? mm. um, but anyway, uh, we had a Baldwin Cinema Two Organ Two Manuals, uh, and for, if you don't know, so organs have multi- multiple keyboards, right? Mm, yeah. So there's a keyboard at your feet. There's a, a keyboard full of just foot pedals that are the twelve notes of the you know of an octave, and you know you you play some. On the bass end. Yeah, right. And and then um, they will have multiple keyboards to play with your hands, and the idea is you get different organ sounds out of the different keyboards, and those keyboards are called manuals. Mm-hmm. You know, smaller organs may have two or three. Big ones will have just going all the way up, just eight or nine. It's just crazy. It gets right? ridiculous, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, we had two manuals uh and all the new electronic sounds i was on and off lessons over the years just didn't want to practice mm. i did attempt box staccato and fugue in d minor at least the opening part yeah mm. ah. that 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 thing okay i get i think uh we would fix up the yard and i'd play it in costume in the living room for the kids when they stopped by on halloween that's <laughs> nice <laughs> So during high school, Ted did put down the organ and picked up the trombone. This was the early 80s, getting into new wave music, Mm B-52s, Devo, Talking Uh, Heads. Yeah, yeah. Uh, The special was the English beat, but put music down after that. I have Uh, a special place in my heart for the specials. (laughs) Fantastic 80s English ska, British ska. Uh, The 80s were an interesting time. Yes, they were. Uh, and uh, Ted continues, in the spring of 2018, I'm watching the new season of Stranger Things on Netflix. Mm-hmm. The original music score is heavy on 80 cent sounds. Yes, it is. So I ended up on YouTube watching clips from the composers and how they made those sounds. Not sure what happened after that, but pretty soon I'm shopping for keyboards and messing around with GarageBand. Yeah, that yeah. happens. Uh-huh. Uh, found a local music school where I take lessons now. That's been an interesting experience since I'm older than many of the parents who are bringing their kids there for lessons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I can actually uh, I, I can feel that because I was taking vocal lessons, like I say, uh, for the past couple of years. Yeah. And at a place called Mason Music here in Birmingham. Right. And it does seem that there are more children taking music lessons on average than adults. So I would go in there. And be waiting behind, you know, seven year old. <laughs> right. Yeah. And this is, these are my peers, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, are... you know, I, I have beginning adult students too at the conservatory where I teach, and uh, they are high on passion and, and inspiration. And uh, I, I love my adult students. Mm-hmm. Really, uh, really glad. I always like to see people pick up music later in life. I, I just firm, I just firmly believe it's never too late. I imagine nine times out of ten, an adult is taking lessons because they want to. Because they want to. Yeah, right. Yeah, that is 100% the reason adults take music lessons. Maybe it's because they're interested. five or six out of the kids, a lot of them are just, I don't know, I can't. <laughs> well, you know, you have, you, you have a, a certain percentage, I guess, that are really, really passionate, and then a certain percentage that are really just being forced to, and then I think the largest percentage, they probably, you know, there's a gray area between that, <laughs> you, you know? Sure, sure. <laughs> Well, um, where we are right now with Ted, he's um, he's been asking a little bit about, and this he's also a Patreon uh, Perfect Fifth member, so he mm. will get his question answered eventually. Mm. Um, he has been asking about Booker T and the MGs Green Onions. Are you familiar <laughs> with that one? <laughs> I don't think you I am. You would know it if you heard it. <coughs> Real cool, cool organ. Hmm. I'll play it for you later on. But anyways... Well, you'll hear it eventually because we're going to do an episode. Mm, yeah, well, we're going to we're going to get into it, huh? <laughs> but um, yes, Ted has asked a question, and we tend to an- we intend to answer it on Patreon mm-hmm. as we do. Real quick, uh, a couple of Patreon woes. Maybe some of our listeners can help us out with. I'm, I'm realizing that um, we're getting more Perfect Fifth members than I antici- that I thought we ever would. <laughs> Back when we started, we thought we'd have maybe three people give us Patreon money. <laughs> right, send a mug over here, answer a question over there, bada boom, bada bing. Yeah, yeah. It, our, our community is growing, though. It is. And this is, is a great problem to have. It's a great problem to have, but I feel like I don't want to fall behind. I don't want someone to be a Perfect Fifth member for a half a year and not having had their question answered. Right. So we ran into three possible solutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, raise the price up. $5, which we don't want to do that. Which we don't want to do that. And not to mention that would involve me going back and re-editing all these episodes. Yeah, no. 
where we talked about that. Um, another one would be mainly just streamline the process, honestly. Yeah. Um, I only said three. I can't remember what the other one was. But then I think the, what we're going to try and do is streamline the process, maybe get together and do three or four Patreon episodes in a day in a setting. In a setting. Yeah, yeah. And then maybe try and make maybe start acknowledging two Patreon people per show. Yeah. Just not as in depth if we've been as we've been doing right, for each yeah. individual. I don't know, man. We're, um, we're trying. We we're, really we're are trying. We're going to do as much as we can in the time we have allotted. Yes, please be patient with us and please know that I get a little ding when you join and I know your name immediately <laughs> from that point on. So it's in my head and in my heart. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you can always we do have a Facebook group now. Yeah. That is, that is really, really awesome because it, it took on a life of its own. Jeremy and I are involved, but we're hardly driving the thing at this point. And yes, the Music Studio 101 Facebook group with an exclamation point by our friend Taylor Handleton um, is a great place for other listeners to uh, meet each other. You know, good it's people. A great thing. Good yeah. pe- people like Seth Woodle. Woodell. Yes, yes. Uh, that mug is on its way, brother. I hope, <laughs> I hope you will get it before this episode releases. That's my goal. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Anyway, thanks again, Ted Jones, for joining us on Patreon. Um, It means the world to us, and it really helps us keep us in coffee. Indeed. And finally, a listener mail. Yeah, um, I don't have um, any quotes or anything. Uh, I'm going to go by what's in my head uh, right here for uh, Jason, a.k.a. Jay the Guitar Player. Because we have heard from him before a few times, actually. Yes, indeed. He's had some really good suggestions. Mm -hmm. Um, He... Has some really good bass player jokes. He's a guitarist who fancies himself <laughs> a joker uh, and and likes to send me a lot of off-color bass player jokes. <laughs> and he's just become a really fun friend and a cool guy to, to stay in touch with. Um, Jason uh, is an auto mechanic. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and for a little while, not too long ago, he took up a job driving semis. Right, I remember that. Which is when he was riding in and saying, hey, turn the piano if I can't hear, because yeah. he's driving. Because <laughs> all the road noise. and you know. <laughs> but uh, he ended up quitting that and saying, uh, that was the worst fucking job ever. <laughs> <laughs> he's back to um, auto mechanic work. But that's cool, because now he can sit down and play his guitar. He was having a problem where he was trying to find a small, crappy guitar and a small, crappy amp. That he can right. take on the road with him. Right. I don't know if you ever found that, but it's not a concern anymore. Well, now he can just sit around and play his, his guitar. Get back to music, sweet music. Yeah, man. But he took the time to write me an email, and uh, he had some really good ideas for some uh, for some future episodes. Would you care to hear a couple of them? Yes. Uh, one is what we're c- covering today, how to practice more efficiently and effectively. Right. A.K.A. practice, practice, practice. Right. Uh, he wants more music history. That's great. We love doing that. Yeah, and we're we're working on that. That's that's been a challenge for us. It has been getting the music history in, just for <clears throat> you know copyright issues and how do we talk about something without examples? But you put in examples, and then you have to pay somebody and exactly. You know. But uh, but we're working on that. Yeah. Another one. Uh, more music careers interviews. Yes, we are a little behind on music career. We interviews. are working on that too. Dirt cheap home recording. That's interesting. Yeah. While we are in music. That, that would be your expert level of expertise. Or, or whatever level that is. <laughs> um, I know enough to get this show done. Well, that's something. But I do think that most musicians will at some point, should at some point, get into the studio. Mm-hmm. And when you do, you're going to want to know what some of these effects are. The basics, man. Reverb, EQ. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing is actually a pretty good thing. And I think soon we're going to be talking to a, a local producer uh, or engineer about that kind of stuff. Nice. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, and then the future of music. That's, oh, gosh. That's a good concept. Yeah, that's a broad topic. Totally broad. But we can assume away. We can, uh, yeah. <laughs> what do you call it, um, speculate, I suppose. Um, but anyway, and finally, arpeggios and why <laughs> my guitar teacher keeps <laughs> forcing them on me when I'm not interested. <laughs> one more time. One more time. <laughs> arpeggios. And why my guitar teacher keeps forcing them on me when, when I'm not I, interested. When I'm not interested. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about, so we're going to cover that in this episode too, I believe. <laughs> uh, Don't you want to be able to do that? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, thanks again, Jason, for all of your correspondence in general. And mm. uh, we've been keeping up with you and we hope you're doing well. And we wanted to give you a special shout out for this episode. Indeed. Very nice. Thanks, Jason, a.k.a. Jay, the guitar player. And let's pick up on one of those suggestions of his, shall we? 
Let us uh, practice, practice, practice. Let us practice, practice, practice. And we're going to, here's, here's the deal. We're going to read, uh, we found one good article about um, just 10 ways to optimize your music practice. Yes. We found a cool article on um, tips on ear training practice for older musicians. Very nice. A lot of our listeners are older musicians. Indeed. We and are older musicians. We are older musicians. Oh, <laughs> you know, I sat down and I said, hey, wait, I'm 42 years old. That means I'm midlife. <laughs> yeah. If I'm lucky. Yeah. yeah. If I'm lucky. If I'm not lucky, I'm way more than midlife. Yeah. Uh, scary to think about, huh? So, yes. So, let's not. So, let's not. <laughs> but we'll, that'll be in the back of our mind as we read <laughs> about that one. And then, finally, at the end of this episode, I do want to talk about uh, the 10,000 hours rule, mm-hmm. which uh, might which might be good news, might be bad news for some, but we'll get into that later on. Okay? Real quick, Matt, before we get into it, uh, do you want to talk about some of your practice routines, if any, regarding your instrument, first off? Oh, well, first off, regarding my instrument, I am far from anything that should be your role model. What Um, instrument do you play, uh, Matt? Um, oh, have I never said? I don't think we have. <laughs> I am a bass player. Oh. Uh, I'm a bass player by heart. Um, I've I've fiddled around with violin as well, uh-huh. and and keyboards as well. But I, I'm I'm and guitar as well. But sure. I'm a bass player at heart. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So nowadays, I only get to pick up my bass and play just just for my own personal benefit. Yes. And I definitely feel it. I definitely feel the lack of practice from the last couple of years. Uh, things that I used to do without even thinking about it, now my hands don't even seem to want to, you know, they kind of protest on me uh-huh. you know, a little bit, because, just because I'm out of practice, just because I don't, I don't sit at my base enough. That has happened to me recently. We'll yeah. get into that. Uh, back when I was practicing, you know, they... Uh, people will uh, people will tell you six hours a day, eight hours a day. <whistles> yeah, um, people will be very proud of themselves because I practice you know practice six hours a day. Um, uh, if there was ever a time in my life where I could devote six hours a day to practicing my instrument, I probably didn't do it. <laughs> and 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 the reality is, and the rea- I imagine the reality for a lot of our listeners is too. We don't have six hours a day to to devote to to, to practicing an instrument. I, I can't imagine a time where I ever would or did. We probably should have. We'd probably be better. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but you gotta eat. I you gotta eat. In there. You gotta work a job. You know. Yeah. You gotta. You know. You, you're, you gotta do all these things. You're a student. You're going to school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For at least eight hours a day. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, I back when I was practicing, I guess I tried to get as much out of that time as I could. Uh-huh. Right? So, um, I practiced, I, I have a few little uh, basic uh, sort of warm-up sort of exercises that I would do. You know, I would run through all my scales. Mm. You know, I would have a couple of little arpeggio exercises that I would do. Yeah. You know, um, and not, <clears throat> these are not things that, that, in, in their pure form like that would ever get incorporated into songs or, or, or bass lines for, for a group or anything. But they kept my hands loose and kept my brain loose. Yeah. Kept me knowing where my scales were, right? Kept me knowing, you know, what notes were what on the on the fretboard and, and you know, being able to pull up that inf- information out of my brain instinctively. Yes. Um, and then, you know, I would usually work on, you know, it depended on what band I was in, you know, you know, whatever covers we were playing, if it was a cover band or whatever originals, you know, uh, that was always challenging, you know, because I'm basically writing a bass line, and, I, and I, would, I would just sort of work on that. I would play those. I would try to get those as comfortable as possible. The things that were very comfortable, I would spend less time on than the things that were awkward, mm-hmm. you know, or if there was ever something that I just outright didn't feel like I was doing, then I would practice that a lot. Yeah. I would focus my attention on those things that needed to be smoother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, um, and uh, do them over and over and over mm-hmm. until, until I, it got, you know, they, 
uh, a sort of a, a, a sports thing that I heard recently. Don't practice until you get it right. Practice until you can't get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I tried to do that. That's I tried. Cool, I tried man. to be that. Practice it over and over again until it was just something my hands did almost of their own accord. Well, <clears> uh, ideally, by the time you hit the stage or um, the yeah. concert hall, you don't want to get it wrong. That's you like, don't want to get it wrong. You want to be able to do be not on autopilot exactly, but but have your your hands know what to do, so your brain can be focused on doing it artfully. Yeah. Or doing it at the right time, or you know, whatever. adding emotion. Once you get past all the uh, mechanics, you can start adding more music to it. Right, right. Make it more musical. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, what about for your compositions? Um, is that something that you now? You, I understand you sit down whenever given the time. You sit down. You wake up in the morning mm-hmm. and do that on mm-hmm. a schedule of some sort. Uh huh. Right. I like my schedule. Yeah. And I'm keep- a I'm a morning composer. I like composing when you know my brain is. You know, still got a lot of energy in it. <laughs> um, but a uh, routine. But routine is Routine, important. yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a such thing as practicing composition, I think. Do tell. Well, I don't know. You know, I've never been a fan of composition exercises. Like, oh, oh we'll try to write just a one-page thing for solo violin or something, or try to write in a, in a key you've never written in before. Okay, that's all great, but uh, personally, I've never been a fan of being that mechanical about it. I always just sat down and composed, Try to was trying to write a piece of music. Mm-hmm. And the, the thing was, in, in doing that, you're also practicing your composition. Yeah. So I tell people all the time, the first thing I ever wrote was pure crap. <laughs> And the second thing I ever wrote was pure crap. Uh-huh. So it was the third, the oh. fourth, pure crap. Oh, Lord. By the fifth, it was maybe approaching merely bad. <laughs> so you have to be willing to endure all the crap before you start to finally feel good about what you're doing. Right, yeah. So And, and so this is, you know, my part of my goal was every time I sat down to write a new piece of music, part of my goal was to, in some way make that piece of music better than the last piece of music I wrote. Yes. So if I look back at a recently finished music and said, oh, well, this is all just one in five all the time. This is boring. Then the next time I would try to have more chords in it. Yeah. And then the next time I thought, well, these are just too many chords. This is convoluted. So I would try to streamline, right? Okay. You know, if I thought, well, my my... The, my phrases are awkward, you know, let's try to write more smooth phrases. And and so, you know, a, a lot of this is sort of deciding where to spend my compositional time, right? Mm-hmm. You know, do I work a couple hours on getting the melody just right? Or, you know, do I try to get this holistic, you know, kind of, I'm inspired to do this and get it all on paper and or, or, or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I would, I would experiment with different approaches and things like that. Just never... One thing I've never done and never wanted to do is just sort of be like a, a composition factory where I'm just doing the same thing all the time mm. and, and just turning them out. Right. You know, I'm, I'm trying to refine my process all the time. And and that's that sort of equates to practicing in my mind, you know. So you, you challenge yourself? Challenge myself, yeah. You review your work? Indeed. I'm sure you critique it? Very much. And then you evolve... Try and adapt, adapt, and change it over time to according to what you think it needs to be as you refine. Right. Yeah, and that can be entirely subjective, and you know, uh, in, entirely just maybe my own opinion of what is and is not good. But you know, that's that's composition for you. Well, I did ask your opinion, didn't I? <laughs> um, my routine is not. Oh, do you have any? Do you have any apps that you recommend for practicing or that you use at all? Or uh, I started the practicing. Stuff before there is a such thing as apps. Uh-huh. So, so my routine is not super app heavy. But the one that you cut your teeth on was called McGamut, right? Right. Well, that's ear training, yeah. And and in in terms of practicing your ear training, yeah, definitely McGamut. Right. I, right. I've got to rec- I've got to recommend McGamut, frankly. Sure, sure. Uh, Very comprehensive. Right. Yeah. And the price has gone down over the years because I understand it's actually still not on a smartphone. Oh no! It's, it is old school. I think they. I think, Desktop. I think they send you a CD with. <laughs> <laughs> you got to sit there at a station. You, you got to burn it onto your computer. Download it on your computer via via disc. 
It feels funny to laugh at that, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. That's that's used to be just the way it was, but. Well, real quick, before we get into this first article, I'll tell you about some of my practice routines. And honestly, at this point in the game, it has become where I don't really have much of a practice routine at all. Mm -hmm. Although the time I spend down here, which is a lot, Mm -hmm. um, be it composing um, bumper music for the show. Right. In which case, I'm always trying to challenge myself. Just like you say, if I'm sitting down, um, my my instruments in order of, I guess, knowledge (laughs) or in order of proficiency is probably bass guitar i'm sorry bass mando banjo uh-huh then guitar then piano then drums uh-huh yeah and each of those i have lots of growing to do um <laughs> bass lines i'm just trying to keep it more solid always keeping it more solid and throwing a cool right. little lick every now and again right yeah um triplets pick it up pick it up pick it up pick it up oh yeah those aren't those are something i try and maybe do more of when i yeah when i'm trying to play cooler stuff yeah yeah on the guitar, if I'm, I try, I try and take a solo. I'm not a soloist, but in every recording, I will try and if I am playing electric guitar, I will put some kind of solo work into it and try sure, and yeah. explore new parts of the fretboard that I haven't. So, sure, yeah. like you're saying, I'm always kind of pushing myself to play something cooler, to surprise myself, give myself <laughs> a little cookie, yeah. give myself a reason to do it more. Yeah, and we do not fit in in this. We do not fit sort of the standard idea of practicing, which is going over things over and over and over and over and over again, you know, doing scales over and over and over and over again. Although at um, some point it was. At, at some, some point, point it was, yeah. yeah. At some point we we definitely did do that. And we went through that. Yeah, yeah. My, um... I but was... I think this other stuff is just as important. Oh, sure, sure. Frankly, you know, I think challenging yourself and, and you know, I'm trying to be better, not just at scales and arpeggios, but at, you know, making music is is, is also important. Well, by the time I got into college, I was pretty familiar with the basic scales and the arpeggios and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I didn't do was have a lot of technical the- uh, technical knowledge. Right. So it wasn't until I got into school and took base- formal bass lessons yeah. that my little pinky started to yeah. feel a little more love on my left hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so a lot of my practice from that point on has been looking at my hands and making sure I'm using the proper technique. The whole hand. Yeah. The whole hand. Yeah, yeah. So proper technique. Yeah, these are things that you know a teacher can can teach you, right? Proper, mm-hmm. And that you also should practice uh, proper technique. Sight reading. I was never very good at sight reading, but oh. I used to be better than I was because I would practice. I would I would try. You know. Jeez, man, you you sat through all of these melodic dictations episodes that we've done, <laughs> and uh, even though sometimes it sounds like I struggled to get it in four or five listens. <laughs> Often there's a t- few listens that are cut out from that. <laughs> I'm going, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> but same with, you know, same with composition. I feel like I get a, a good amount of practice in comp- composing things, mm-hmm. just doing what I do down here. <clears throat> um, and then some apps that I recommend uh, as far as performance goes, there's one called U- Musician with a Y. I think I've talked about it many times, but... Um, you're actually sitting down at your instrument. I'm using it for piano. Mm-hmm. And it's showing the notes come by, not unlike Rocksmith, which is another app I recommend. Right. The notes come up, little thing bounces on them. You hit it right then and there. You, know, you have notation, you have color coding, you have all these different tabs, you have all these mm-hmm. different options. Mm-hmm. But uh, it gives you rewards and you get to move up to the next level. All those little fun things about video games that make that oxytocin boost when you get to a certain point. Yep. It's cool. Yeah. You know, so... That's those, those are a couple of good apps that I recommend. Musician for I think they do piano, voice, ukulele, guitar, bass. Mm-hmm. Rocksmith is really just bass and guitar, right? But they have a lead guitar mode, they have a rhythm guitar mode, and so on. Um, and then there's some other cool little apps I found recently. Let's see. There's one that our friend Paul Olson told us about called Functional Ear Trainer, where they play a chord progression. And then they'll play a note from that from that key, and you have to identify what note it is. And I tried it, and I liked it. It worked really good. Uh. I also found this other one called Ear Cat, and it's uh, actually for ages four and up. And it's really cute. It's really has this jazzy intro, and it's similar to the app that I just mentioned, except it plays up the scale that you're in, and then it drones the tonic, and then plays a note, and that's the note that you have to choose. Okay. Check it out, man. Ear Cat. It's kind of cute, really nice art. Yeah. I got this little cat. <laughs> a cat on the tree. Fun. Okay. So, yeah, man. Um, apps are your friends. That's something we didn't have back in the day so much. Yeah, really. 
Now, let us go ahead and get into this first article, okay? Okay. This I found on NPR.org. Mm. This is called 10 Easy Ways to Optimize Your Music Practice by Anastasia who, mm. uh, Sukalas. 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 Yeah. Greek, I imagine. Yeah. It's Greek or Russian. Oh, I don't know. T.S.? Uh, maybe, maybe Greek, actually. Just another name I can't pronounce. <laughs> but Anastasia is a seasoned writer for NPR Music. She's been around for some time. Oh, good. So um, this article features 10 cool tips, mm-hmm. and we're going to hit each one of them and pepper it with our side BS. <laughs> so are you ready? Yes. I'll take the first one. Okay. Find somewhere quiet. At best, have a designated room. At worst, maybe like a corner in the living room. Uh-huh. Um, it's also part of establishing a ritual or a schedule. Like right. you said, you every morning you probably go down. Where do you go? Um, I'm usually composing in my office upstairs. You have an office. Yeah, yeah. Closed door. You close. Door. Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you know, I have this little studio down here, mm-hmm. and it's it's pretty ideal. It's really quiet. You know, that's that's how we can have a couple of SM eighty ones. Hanging over our head. Yep. Mm. <laughs> and still have it sound pretty crisp and clean. Yeah. So I get a lot of solitude down here. Yeah. Does it make me practice more? I don't know. Uh, it depends on your definition of practice. I might take it for granted, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> um, and, you know, if you're a keyboardist or if you play any kind of MIDI-based digital instrument, you could just plug that right into your laptop or put yeah. your headphones in. Right, and, uh, yeah. Just play without bothering anybody. Right. Or right, anybody yeah. bothering you because yeah. you have your headphones in. Yeah, I think the idea here, though, is to have a designated space that is a music space. Mm-hmm. You know, so that you have a space where when you're in that space, you are thinking musically and doing musical things. You're in you the know. mode. Yeah, you're in the mode. Uh, you know, don't just, uh, you know, don't just try to play guitar in, you know, your bedroom or, you know, <laughs> in, in the kitchen or something, you know. Right, yeah. <laughs> That'd be kind of funny playing guitar while cooking eggs or something like yeah, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I know a lot of people will sit on the couch and, and noodle while they watch TV and things. And well, now I have done that. Yeah. And because I use my electric guitar, I'm not bothering too many people. Right. But I'll sit there and I'll play hooks like I hear a commercial come yeah. on. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, I'll do that too. I can't uh, stand nationwide, by the way. <laughs> don't even know why I sing their, sh- their jingle. stupid jingle. But. <laughs> I've had problems with nationwide. Anyways, next uh, next tip. You want to take this one? Next tip. Uh, have your supplies nearby. Mm. Uh, we assume that means in your selected work area. Uh, supplies, I think, depending on what you're doing, might include your tuner mm-hmm. to tune your instrument, mm-hmm. uh, notepad to, to write down ideas. If you can't get notation paper, at least have a notepad. Right. Yep, yep. Uh uh, pencil with a good eraser. Uh, musicians never write anything in pen. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Never write anything in pen. No one's uh, that good. Yeah. Uh, literature. You know, uh, if you're if you're working out of a book or if you're working out of a a, a, a set of f- charts or something. If you're if you're working on a particular song and you have the the music there, you know, have have all that stuff ready to go. Don't be having to run around looking for that. Yeah, right. Because this is this is a this is a maximize efficiency kind of thing, right? Anytime you're having to hunt around for all your stuff, you're not getting good practice time in. Right? Exactly. You're having to put down the practice, or it's it's interfering with your ability to stay in that mode, you know. Mm-hmm. And you know, yeah. The only other supply I think um, to have around supply item that we didn't really mention your in. instrument. <laughs> well, that's important. <laughs> yeah. But a metronome. Yes, I know that last time. Uh, our melodic dictation episode, we actually implemented the metronome. Mm. And though we mentioned that it was kind of a crutch, it yeah. can be kind of a crutch, but early on, you still want to get an idea of what 120 BPM, yeah. what 60 BPM, you want to get an idea of what tempos are. Right. Which is something I didn't spend a lot of time focusing on in my Doing, opinion. no, me either. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's, I mentioned frequency. This is just one, one thing I came up with, like a frequency chart. My pianos, I tend to put the frequencies on the keys, or not on the keys, but in a little space over the key, I'll put like some tape down yeah. and write down the frequency so I can have an idea of what notes occupy what frequency. That's, a, gr- that's a great idea, what Spe- if- especially when you're mixing, especially when you're EQing. Exactly. So uh, I'll know, for example, the human voice 
has like 84 or has a certain frequency range yeah. that it occupies. Well, that means that I can take down everything else yeah. beyond that. Right. Anyways, um, it's just a good, good little things to have around. And so let's move on to number three. Technology can be an amazing aid. Mm. Now, this mainly seems to apply for those who have a smartphone, tablet, or laptop. Right, and some of the apps and in, in, uh, software you mentioned previously. Yes, yes. And many of these apps might have, at least at least you want to have a metronome, a tuner, and a timer. Mm. Now, we talked about why to have a metronome. Right. Tuner, I think, is kind of obvious. I feel like your guitar you, needs to be in, ta- in tune. That's important. What about a timer? Where might you use a timer, Matt? I don't know. Maybe think, to, to make sure you're not, you know, meaning to practice for three hours and end up practicing all night or something like that. That's one thing. That's one thing. Later on, we're going to talk about delegating time slots to different challenges. Oh, yeah. Uh, good point. So what if you just, or even if you just say, I'm going to sit down for an hour today, boom, right. set the timer. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. in the back mm-hmm. of your, you know, in the backdrop, have a timer. Okay, so let's move on. What else? Number four. I like this one. Begin with an end in mind. Oh, uh, yeah? Have a goal before you begin each practice session. What will I work on today? How much time should I delegate to each exercise? Your music teacher or instructor can help you with this. Right. And that is true. And that is that is one of the big things that I find helpful is, is to, you know, when I was practicing, I would have, you know, songs I wanted to learn and get under my fingers. You know, that was a... That was, uh, uh, that was the goal. That was the end that I, that I had in mind. You know, I think, I think, you know, people will tell you to practice all the time and they never tell you what or how to do that. And then you kind of, you, you can kind of end up sitting down and going, okay, I'm supposed to be practicing. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, and you would just kind of end up noodling because you don't really have any, you don't have an end in mind. You don't have a goal in mind. So, Especially you know. when doing it on your own. Exactly. So if, so to set as your goal, well, I want to learn this song or I want to work on these exercises, mm-hmm. and and that is and that makes it better. And yeah, your your instructor can help you uh, plan out, you know, how much time does this exercise deserve? Mm. Right, you know, uh, you'll find that the more you practice, the more quickly you get things under your fingers. The the easier it becomes to assimilate new information, and you learn songs faster than you used to. Right. And this might be a good time for that timer as well. If I, if my teacher, my instructor, they, they'll usually give you homework. Mm-hmm. So Cleve might have said, hey, learn these three jazz standards. Right. Well, I'll go and sit down for an hour and I'll spend 20 minutes on one, 20 minutes on the other, 20 right. minutes on the other. Absolutely. And even if I don't nail them all the way through, at least I have that much You spend exposure. 20 minutes on each of them. And the next time you sit down, you spend this 20 minutes on each of them again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So cool, man. That's a good one, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I actually like that twenty minutes on each song, right? Because you can you can reach a point of diminishing returns where you're actually not getting better anymore. You know, your brain is 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 fried. Yeah, you know, you've practiced one thing so much that that it's uh, you sort of stopped improving. You know, the music loses its meaning. The music loses its meaning, the and you, you find that you're actually thoughts. not doing it as well as you did maybe. 20 or 30 minutes before that, you know, you're like not getting up to where you were, right. you know, forget moving forward. Right? And at that point, it's time to either stop and take a break or, or work on something else. You know? Diminishing returns is a good way to put that, I think. Yeah. Okay, number five. Yes. Map a practice session like a workout. I don't work out at all, so I, was, I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say, what is this thing they call work Jeremy and out. I do not exercise uh, ever. Yeah, uh, yeah. My exercise is is walking to class. <laughs> you know, so we just have the vain musician diet of not eating too much crap and uh, yeah. trying to maintain a relative weight, healthy right. weight, right throughout our forties. Right. Um, but it says some musicians have breathing and stretching rituals before they pick up their instrument. I have heard that. I've never done that. Mm, I've never done that, but I I know a lot of musicians do. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, especially if you're playing something like the the violin or something that requires you to hold a particular uh, sort of stance for a long time. Oh, you know? well, I can see breathing exercises if you're playing like a tuba or hey, something oh, yeah, that involves yeah, pushing absolutely. a lot of air. Yeah, yeah. Like pipes. Right, yeah, yeah. Anything I remember, like you know, practicing violin, I remember my muscles would get really stiff. Just, just holding that... St- dance that that very specific kind of way of standing and holding your arms for a long time my muscles were, so i could really see some stretching exercises or things 
But even if you don't do that, it's most important to um, to kind of warm your fingers up with the scales and arpeggios. Right. Jay, guitar player. Yes. Make this a part of your warm up. <laughs> right. Scales back and forth. Hopefully in two octaves if you can, three if you have it. Uh, you know. Oof. I, I'm at a point in my life where I get up on stage and um, I, fi I find that I am punished for not having warmed up. Like I used to, even t five years ago, 10 years ago, I could just get up on stage and start playing. So let's just go, yeah. So now I have to really sit down before I start playing and actually go through some scales or something like that, you know, at least five or six yeah. minutes, you know, just sitting there mindlessly playing scales before I start playing. Yeah, yeah. I always wondered if that was because I was trying to do harder stuff as I than I did when I was, you know, a teenager or if I was just, you know, my fingers were just naturally stiff because I was older or, you know, what. Sure. Yeah. And within this workout, they recommend a certain order for one thing, th thinking, you know, start off thinking about your technique. Mm -hmm. Then move on to analyzing what you're working on and engaging your theory brain, as they say. Theory brain. Finally, have a cool down period where you go over some material that you already know and maybe try and add some improv or embellishment to it. Right. That's interesting. A cool maybe, down. but mainly just is in a cool down, just kind of play stuff you feel good about. That's kind of where you reward yourself a little yeah. bit. You worked hard. Now you just want to have fun. Right. You know, right. Make yeah. some music. Mm -hmm. Very cool, man. So that's yeah. a good one. Yeah. Practice smarter, not necessarily longer. Number six. Yeah. Give yourself a small dedicated time slot to work on a problem area. And, you know, this is... I didn't articulate it this well, but but this is kind of what I was saying when I was talking about my routine was like, if there's something that I really wasn't doing as well as I thought, you know, I would take some time and work, and work on just that, mm -hmm. just those four measures or, or, or just that one riff uh -huh. know, or, or, or uh, whatever. Yeah, um, this might be a good time for the timer. Maybe a good time to, for a timer, yeah, because you can just work on it for five or ten minutes. Um, I'm a little too obsessive for that. I'm going to work on it till I get it right. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but that, but that's just me. That's just me. Even beyond the point of diminishing returns? It, it, so if I'm not careful, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes uh, tragically beyond the point Yeah. For myself. Um, if you have a problem measure, use this time to dig deep into it. Uh, break it down. Uh, change the rhythms. If you're still having... Problems play it more slowly mm -hmm. is a good is a good technique. Yeah, you know, play it slow and then work until you can get it fast. Absolutely, right? good right, time um, to have that metronome too. Yep, yeah. If you're still having problems, make a little note or a question mark. Come back to it next time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there are things that you can work on for weeks, months before it, before you really feel like you've gotten it. Right. You know, um, don't be impatient with yourself. Uh -huh. you know, it, can, it can really kill you. Um, so many people, I feel like, give up on a musical instrument because they think, you know, oh, I'm, I, you know, they're, they're constantly saying, well, I'm not getting this, I'm not getting this. And the truth is, this is, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, people who are good at it are not good at it because they had some magical ability they, that you don't, you know, it's a question of be, be patient with yourself. You know, start, start on a level that is, comfortable for you mm -hmm. you know and and you know uh get comfortable and then get just a little bit uncomfortable yeah and stay just a little bit uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable again mm -hmm. then then work on something else that's just a little bit uncomfortable right you know this this is how we this is how we move forward slowly you know and in the suggestions uh here about as, as far as working on a problem zone say you have a measure there's some really funny things that they're talking about, like try and play it backwards. Try and play it backwards. I mean, that's really digging deep into it. Yeah, uh, I don't know how the that would help. Yeah, well, I think it's just a matter of having to know it that well. Yeah, if you right, know I, I that suppose. Well. Yeah. I can't say the ABCs backwards. But uh, I can say the ABCs. Yeah. Uh, hmm. I used to could. P. P O N M L. Uh huh. P O N M L. K J I H. G F E D C B A. I can't confirm that. 
but it sounds right. And you weren't like just singing it. You had to sit there and think about it. I had to sit there and think about it. <laughs> and you notice once I got to G, I was home free because I, I could just envision, envision the fretboard. Walking down the and, scale. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's C. That's a cool little <laughs> trick. Okay, let's move on to the next one here. Okay. Don't start at the beginning every time. And this no. harkens back to my melodic dictation um, yeah. episode. Right. Because you would play maybe four measures. Uh-huh. And I would hear something that I recognize in the third measure. Right. And uh-huh. I would just go ahead and write that down. And yeah. I would yeah. find myself skipping around. Yep. But what they're kind of saying is, as good as it feels to play the opening passage perfectly, there may be more digestible material in other parts. Mm-hmm. Plus, if everyone just focused on playing the opening perfectly, that would be the best part of the whole performance and everything and the rest else would suck. Yeah. Would just suck more and more. <laughs> One of the go. most eye-opening things I ever witnessed was the first time I saw a symphony orchestra rehearse. Yeah. And, and it was it was really an awesome experience just to see first of all how, you know, just in, you know, serious musicians they all are and mm-hmm. you know, you're talking maximum efficiency level. Right. You know, um but one of the big things I noticed was, you know, they they came out and they're not uh, and the first thing they did was not, okay, let's start from the top and run through this. Mm. You know, the conductor came out and said, everybody turn to rehearsal mark G. Oh, yeah. Whatever. Because that was the challenging part. That was the part that was going to take communication. Ah. So we're we're going to nail that. You know, okay. You're kind of expected to be able to play the introduction, right? These are all people who can sight read. And, and often <clears> the part <throat> that most people are familiar with. So it's yes. probably already... In their heads, or we've already played a thousand times or whatever. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so uh, they came out, and what we're going to do is work on the problem spots first. Mm. You know, because because like I said, you know, maximum efficiency here, and it, yeah, it was really eye opening. You know, don't you don't necessarily have to start from the top. Every band in existence, that's how they practice, right? They say, okay, two, three, it's true. four, and, and then it's they true. start playing it, right? Yeah, but. Uh, we never say, okay, boys, let's go straight to this Let, bridge. Let's here. work on this bridge because we didn't get it right last time. Or night. girls. Yeah. Maybe we should think about that sometimes. Maybe yeah. we should, you know. I think most people feel comfortable playing it through at least once just to get a feel for what they're trying to do. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. But there you go. Good one, though. Yeah. It makes perfect yeah, sense. Good one. And practical, it seems, in my life. <laughs> yeah. So moving on to number eight. What mm-hmm. you got, Matt? So number eight, challenge yourself physically. Mm. Researchers suggest that if you add a physical challenge, uh, to, it's like <laughs> standing on one leg, <laughs> walking around uh, to a difficult passage of music, or if your brain will carve out new neural pathways that it wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, I wonder if practicing while under the influence of, of you know, <laughs> narcotics is the same kind of thing, right? Study drunk, test drunk. Yeah, we're not we're not endorsing that, by the way. Nope. Uh, nope, nope. We're, we're, I'm just wondering aloud. Uh, and the original task will be easier in its er, original intended execution. You know, I can tell you. Yeah, I mean, if you're playing in an actual band, uh, there's something to be said for gaining the ability to move around while playing, right? That is a very practical physical you know, because challenge. Because people are looking at you as well as listening to you, and you know if you look stiff, it, it will affect how they interpret what you're playing. Yeah, I, I found that when I moved around on stage a good bit more, pe- I got a better crowd response and sure better energy. People feel like they're seeing more of a show. Sure, yeah. And when I first started moving, or started playing live, I had a real problem with I couldn't move and play at the same time. You know. Yeah, so, yeah, that that kind of stuff. Like, you know, it's like I would move around more. I would move around more, but I mess up my bass line when I do. Uh-huh. So. If I walk this way, I go up the scale. If I walk that way, I go down yeah, the scale. Right. Crap. <laughs> what are some other physical challenges we can add? I know one. I don't suggest standing on one leg. I'm sorry. Ah, that's just... Je- Jethro Tull, Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull. That's how he, he played. He the stood flute. on one leg. Standing on one leg. I don't know if he did uh. it. I think he did it to look like a minstrel. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Um, but anyways, that was just a thing he did. I, I thought I remember hearing the story behind it and kind of laughing, but uh, I don't do that. No. I don't. Rec- you could probably hurt yourself if you're not careful. Yeah. What are some other physical challenges? One that I give myself is I used to sit down, lay down in my bed with the lights out mm-hmm. so I can't see. Playing in the dark. Playing in, in the general. dark. Yeah. Um, sitting there watching the TV while noodling, so you're kind mm-hmm. of your attention is divided. Right. New neural pathways are being created there. Right. Because you're watching the show and you're just kind of sitting there playing the guitar. Yeah. Random riffs, and then maybe a commercial comes on, you recognize it, <laughs> and you play along, or you play with yeah. the music of the show. Yeah. Yeah. 
if that's the case of your attention being a little bit divided, so I don't or, know if that's the same or, as Or, yeah, your, um, your attention being divided, yeah, you're kind of multitasking, but also, yeah, you're forming those pathways, you know, you're, you're learning how to listen to music and replicate it. Mm-hmm. You know, and your, your fingers are working on uh, learning the, the muscle motions of, of having your instrument in your hands. So ear training and execution, yeah. two most important parts of me, yeah. a musician, I think. Yeah, um, playing in the dark is definitely a good one. Uh, yeah, shoot, what else? You know, turning your guitar around so that you're having to play left-handed. Ooh. You know? Yeah. I've never done that, but I'm sure it can open up some kind of neural pathway. I, who knows, <laughs> yeah. All right, man, so that's a good That's a good one, I think. Yep. I think. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Practice away from your instrument. Ha-ha. Mm-hmm. You know, many professionals and artists use visualization techniques even when they're away from their craft. Oh, sure. Athletes, Mm -hmm. they do that. You know, maybe bring some notation paper with you and just kind of bust it out on the bus. (laughs) You don't have your instrument, but you can sit there and read the notes and visualize yourself playing them. Sure. Yeah. If I'm on the way to a gig that I'm playing, I have my little playlist of the songs I'll be playing that night. Yeah. And as I'm driving, my left hand is kind of fretting (laughs) while I'm driving, probably don't Pull, you know, I try not to do that. Yeah, in front of if you've office. ever, if you ever watched me, it, it's gotten to the point of nervous tick now that I, I do right hand ex, uh, technique exercises with my, uh, you know, uh, right hand based technique exercises. Yeah. Just not even, not, not even paying attention. Just if I'm sitting there mindlessly, you know, uh, I'll be doing this little right hand technique kind of things. You know? Well, actually, this is really bad because when I'm driving. I'm fretting with my left hand. My right hand is on the base on the wheel, yeah. playing the wheel, playing the yeah the steering uh-huh. wheel like it's a bass. Yeah, yep. Just don't get anywhere near me on the on the <laughs> You see my car. <laughs> he needs a warning bass Drive player. Away. Yeah, he needs a needs a war- uh, bumper sticker that says warning bass player driving or something. Now, in regards to the notation paper thing, if you don't read music, I would suggest just doing what we were talking about, your own visualization. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you hear a passage you've played before yeah. and you know it, try and visualize yourself playing it. Yeah. Even, or even if you don't know it, try and envision what it might be like. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And People, then you can test yourself when you get home, and you you, you get you can get to your instrument. Air guitarists have been pulling that off wonderfully for years. I think. <laughs> yeah, some of the best air guitarists aren't guitar players at all. Yeah, they just mimic the motions yeah. <laughs> and the faces and the faces. Yeah. Okay, so we got one more tip here from this uh, article. Okay, what you got, Matt? Uh, reward your hard work in positive ways. This is probably the most important one. Hmm. But to reward your hard work in positive ways. First of all, I think it's very, very important to be positive with yourself, just just in general. Yeah. You know, um, don't be down on yourself. Don't, don't, uh, try li- not to be frustrated. In life, not just in music. Not just in music, but in life. Music can teach you about life. Sure it can. You know, when you're, when you're learning to play an instrument, recognize the fact that this is hard, no matter who you are, no matter what your walk of life Learning to play an instrument is hard. You know, don't don't let your frustration build into an attitude of "I'm never going to get it," because mm-hmm. you are going to get it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, recognize the progress you made in this session, in this week, mm. you know, in this month, you know, this past year. You know, recognize that. So, and and be positive about yourself in general. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think it's very, very important. The world doesn't necessarily make that easy for you. Yeah. The world of the practicing musician doesn't necessarily make that easy for you. You know, you run into people sometimes who have this attitude like, oh, well, I practice eight hours a day or, or I'm, you know, I am the, you know, I am the uber alpha male guitarist or drummer or, you know, <laughs> cello player or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it doesn't always make it easy for you to be positive about your progress uh, and you're accomplishing but but right. do be positive towards yourself number one maybe don't compare yourself so much to other people maybe not yeah you know and Strive. and maybe don't maybe don't take on their their ego trips maybe don't internalize them yourself uh-huh. you know um i i've never met a musician i couldn't criticize <laughs> 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 that sounds bad, but you get what I'm saying, right? Everybody's got something they can they can work on. Yeah, absolutely. You know, everybody's got something they can work on. So you work on your thing and be po- be positive to yourself. Number one, mm-hmm. rewarding your work in a positive way. You know, um, maybe if you've practiced, you know, we talked earlier about ending on something fun. Yeah, ending on something jam like it's fun to jam. 
You know, this can be when you're practicing by yourself, when your brand is practicing. At the end of practice, you know, practice, you know, just do some blues jamming or something. Yeah. You know, reward yourself for that hard work or, or play something you all just really like to play. We used to, uh, uh, some of the bands I'm in or I was in, we used to just, just in practice with something that we all just thought was fun to play. Oh, that's cool. Know? Yeah, it's like, well, and there was one or two songs we would end every practice with just because we liked it. Mm. And it was a good sort of palate cleanser, and, you know, we played it very, very well. And, and it wasn't challenging necessarily, but it was fun. And, yeah, mm. and we ended, uh, that is that is good. You know, of course, there's always the reward yourself, you know. It's like, well, you know, I've practiced a lot. You know, maybe now I'm going to go have a beer and watch Netflix. Oh, that's you know? funny you said that because that was going to be my thing. I was going to say, <laughs> well, you know, I just had dinner. It's about nine o'clock at night. This would be a perfect time to crack open a beer. But maybe I'm going to do this thirty minutes of practice and then reward yourself then, with a beer. Yes, yeah. yes. Or reward yourself with some music, right? Or, a, or reward yourself by not thinking about music. If you've practiced for an hour, huh. you could be like, okay, I have been practicing for an hour. Maybe that's enough music for me today. I'm going to do something completely unmusic related. Maybe go watch that new cool Disney based Star Star Wars thing. Yeah, maybe but, that. Yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty. Which dumb. everybody is talking about. Yeah. I guess I have to watch it. It's pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Okay. Well, that is. Um, I think that's enough to say about this article, right? I think, I, I think so. I think there's some good tips here. We got some good practice insights on more efficient and more. Uh, yeah, I, I think the the overwhelming the overwhelming point for me is, you know, take it slow. You know, um, be patient with yourself. You know, and Work on things. Work on things slowly but deliberately. A little bit of a time, and watch how easier they become. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Now we have ourselves another article that I um I found interesting. I was just googling ear training tips, mm-hmm. but then I found one from our old friends at MusicalU dot com. Oh, look at that! Remember our friends from MusicalU dot com? Yes. They had they had this great article called. Uh, 10 Ear Training Tips for the Adult Beginner Ah. by Sabrina Pena Young. Okay. Now, some of these tips we kind of covered a little bit anyways. Yeah, so it'll kind of be uh, redundant. but Well, rather than prattle off all 10 of them, we'll just give the highlights of some of the things that we haven't covered, as it does apply to older musicians. Okay. Such as ourselves. Such as ourselves. (laughs) And this is actually, seems like it's more for people who are really just getting into ear training. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. So uh, what's the first one that our friends at Musical U recommend? Well, they say start simple. Mm -hmm. Maybe with minimalist composers such as Cage or Oliveros. Ooh, I wouldn't start with either one of those. Give us your own. Maybe start with minimalist composers like uh, Steve Reich or Philip Glass. You know, you can... Uh, uh, they have the uh, they they have musical quality, and they did it for artistic purposes. But they have this quality of using a minimal amount of materials over and over again. Mm-hmm. So you get lots of chances to hear something, oh. and sort of hear what it's what it's like. Good point. Yeah, uh, Philip Glass has several uh, pieces that are rhythmic pieces, mm-hmm. uh, music for four hands, or I think actually the name of it is clapping music. Oh yeah. And then there's uh, another one like that for sets of wood blocks, you know. And, you know, see if you can dictate those rhythms out as you hear them. You know? he, didn't he kind of um, usher in that whole arpeggiating symphonic... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that was glass. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, but you're also kind of... You're listening for environments. You're kind of listening for musical environments, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, try to separate the low sounds from the high sounds. Pay attention to tempos. Rhythms, dynamics. When you listen to any kind of music, it's always a good ex- a good exercise to sort of close your eyes and ask yourself, what am I hearing? Mm. And see how many things you can come up with as answers to that question. So don't hear it as just music, but dig a little bit deeper and find descriptions. Yeah. Well, I mean, first off, you're hearing music. Yes, that's the simple. Too easy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that That's the start. And so then you ask yourself, well, what kind of music? Mm-hmm. You know, what are these chords? And what instruments are, is this being played? Mm-hmm. Right is um, where is the melody? You know, is the melody a high instrument or a low instrument? You know, um, is this rhythm fast or slow? Uh, uh, how does the rhythm relate to the melody? You know, does the melody stick to the rhythm? Does the melody play against the rhythm? Yeah. You know, how many melodies are there? Yeah. You know, uh, how does if there are words, how does this music serve 
the lyrics? How you know? Does it does it create a tone for the lyrics? Does it, is it mimicking the lyrics? You know. To which I would add what you were saying as far as picking apart the different melodies. Also, you know, when 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 a non musician or someone with an untrained ear hears music that really moves them, they're just getting hit by a wash of sound. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. But as you start to train your ears, you can actually listen for parts. Okay, what is this thing doing? Let me just focus on this little guy for a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me move over here and focus on this one a third yeah. above it. And What's you can that do doing? that every time you listen to music. Mm -hmm. And and become much better at understanding exactly what's going on. And that skill will translate to you playing it. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. Okay. Now, this next tip is kind of cute. Uh, test your hearing. <laughs> Clearly, this is for no. older musicians. Um <laughs> One out of three people between the ages of 65 and 74 have some form of hearing loss. Uh -huh. And about half of those over 75 have difficulty, have difficulty, hearing. difficulty hearing in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and this can start as early in life as your 30s or your 40s. Absolutely. Obviously, different uh, environmental factors apply, but then mm -hmm. some people just have that. That's just their bio uh, biology. Mm -hmm. It just happens. Yep. You know, um, they say that uh, the high end frequencies are the first to go. That's true because the high end frequencies hit your ba brain via um, the tiny microscopic fibers in your ear that are the smallest and most fragile. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so uh, harsh frequencies, harsh back and forth of the, the liquid in your inner ear shatters them, and then yeah. you, you can't hear those frequencies anymore. Why did you have to say it like that? <laughs> shatters them. <laughs> Scary, huh? I got this funny app called. Annoy a teen, <laughs> and it actually did work because it actually does annoy teens. Chloe at the time uh, was probably about thirteen, <laughs> and um, I got this app, and it plays these frequencies that only young people can hear because they still can. And sure enough, I push the little button, and no I hear nothing. But I walk over to Chloe, and I'm like, "Chloe, can you hear this?" She's like, "Yes, it's annoying." <laughs> I was like, "Yes, I annoyed my teen." <laughs> oh, great, but um. I don't know. I, I did decide that, you know, hearing is is kind of my livelihood, right? Right. I'm a sound engineer. I do location audio. Mm. Sometimes I'm exposed to loud sounds and loud noises, if not just not thinking about how loud my headphones are. Yeah. Um. I decided to go ahead and get myself this little hearing test app nice. called Mimi, M-I-M-I. -M -I, nice. Hearing test. And I sat there in my ISO booth, and I got my best isolating headphones on, and I took the test. How'd you do? I have the ears of an 18-year-old man, Matt. Awesome. That's I'm awesome. I'm not sure how accurate that test was. <laughs> I, there's no way in hell I can have the ears of an 18-year-old man. Well, I mean, if you've taken care of them. Maybe so. Yeah. I just didn't think I did that because I've been playing live music for a long time. Yeah. Well. But what it does is it plays, Um, it'll play frequencies in one ear and it'll play it in the other. Right. Yeah. I can't remember if it's all one ear and then the other ear. Yeah. But they'll do it in varying frequencies and volume levels. Mm. So you're trying to find out. Do I hear this frequency at this volume, at this volume, at this volume? Yeah. And it goes higher and higher until you're like, okay, I just don't hear anything. Sure, yeah. You know? And you can get an idea of, based on that mm. where you sit, right? Yeah. where your ears are. Pretty cool. Yeah. Hearing those frequencies at the very upper range of your hearing is a weird experience anyway. Mm, it, it is. It gets into, those, into that range where you're almost... Not sure if you heard it or felt it. Yes. Yeah, it's just it's almost like it's a vibration in your skull or something. It's like it's or, not even a sound. Yeah, or just a phantom thing. Like, yeah. Do you ever get phantom phone buzz? Oh, that's, sure. That's the weirdest thing when your phone's not in your pocket yeah. and you get a buzz. I get phantom music playing. I think I'm just going crazy. But. Oh, well, there's a book about you, then we're going to have to write. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting, Matt, though, seriously. Yeah, well, it, it's, it's happened. Huh. Well, you want to take the next yeah, one, Yeah, so the next one. Uh, test your ear training skills and evaluate where you are. Uh, our good friends at Musical U, of course, offer extensive evaluation, but mm -hmm. there are other apps sure. as well. Musical U is a paid service, and you get what you pay for. Absolutely. Yeah. But not everyone has that to put in monthly. Uh, if, you, if you don't have the funds, uh, Teoria.com is pretty good. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Karahan. Karahan, yeah, that was a good one. Is, a, is, is pretty good. Although they changed the name to, I think... Um, Musical ear or something. Oh, did they? Oh, yeah. there you go. Better ears, I think. Is what okay, they're. okay, yeah. V definitely a good one. Mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, you can you can test your ear. You know, we have episodes of this podcast where we're dictating melodies. You know? Yes, we do. You know, just, and, you know, it's always good to sort of uh, just assess where you are. Again, not 
to say, well, this is, I'm only this good, but to say, well, this is where I am and yeah. this is where I can, this is how I can improve. Yeah. How do you know where to go unless you know where you're at? Absolutely. Okay. So next, um, let's see here. I'm not a hundred percent sure about this order <laughs> because I think I've done it differently. I'm not sure. I think we've done it a bit differently. So tell me what you think about this. Mm -hmm. They recommend starting with rhythm. You know, um, even if you can't play anything, you can tap your foot. You sure. can snap your fingers. You can yep. clap. Mm -hmm. Many people can dance. I can't. <laughs> but a lot of old people can dance. I see a lot of old people dance. Um, let's see here, senior citizens. I see a lot of senior citizens dancing. Right, yeah, yeah. Then then move on to melody and then harmony. Yeah. Where I think that we kind of focused on harmony a little. It's not It's not until just recently that we're actually trying to have this melody boom you know, yeah. on the show. Yeah. We did uh, Mixolydian recently, Ionian. Sure, yeah. And these ear training it, things. It depends on if you're, if you're, um, it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh-huh. You know, if you're trying to understand, the, the reason we sort of start with harmony, I think, is because we're trying to get a sense of how these chords work with each other, what they, what the chords sound like, so mm -hmm. you understand what those chords are. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to actually dictate a, <clears throat> dictate a piece of music out, or to understand what's going on, then it makes sense to start with the things that are most prevalent, the rhythm and then the melody. And then because the chords are, you know, it'd probably take a little more uh, uh, strain and effort to, yeah. to, to determine, you know, maybe then start thinking about chords. Mm -hmm. So sure. Well, that's okay. So that's reasonable. Yeah. And then finally, involve a friend. This is a great chance to connect with another musical friend or family member. Um, my friends and I will geek out over stuff, and um, like we did at the J. Clyde so many times. You talk about so actually many times. Are you actually actually sitting down and making a time where y'all get together and talk? Uh, well, music theory. I don't think we ever have actually sat down and and said, "Well, let's sit down and talk about music theory." But it's, we geek out all happens. the time. Uh, I got I got texted not too long ago from a from an old. A uh, colleague of mine, a good friend of mine, saying, "Have you heard this?" And then, of course, you know, I listened to it, and then we, we were geeking out over it for the net, you know, back and forth for for a long time after that. You know, uh, okay, having musical friends is is uh, a real treasure. It truly it really is. is. It truly is. It's kind of funny because um, music is in a, has actually been what's kept me and some of my old high school friends even together. Yeah, Brian Malloy comes over every week and puts down a drum track for one of our shows <laughs> yeah. or something yeah. like that. Um. It's certainly at the center of, of, of been at the center of my life. My oldest friends are all musicians, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I had at this point in my life, I do have a couple of friends that are not musicians per se, but even they are musical, right? You know, uh, and 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 yeah, I, um, it, it's a real, tr especially if you're trying to be a better musician yourself. You know, having having that support group, you know, having those people who. It keep you excited about it when you know, and you don't have to keep yourself excited about it. It's it's invaluable. Well, it's like you know, some people like to go for walks. They like to walk with other people. They like mm -hmm. to go jogging with other people. It can be a communal thing. Yeah. And um, I don't know how practical it is for me in my life right now to be like, hey, bud, let's get together for two hours and and <laughs> test each other's ears. Uh, yeah, that does not sound like a fun time. <laughs> but uh, for someone who's just getting into it, that might be a fun time. Maybe you know what I mean. Maybe or someone so. who's as passionate about ear training. Um, and and has a kid or something like that who's yeah. getting into music, that could be a great bonding experience. Absolutely. The one last thing that I thought was pretty darn interesting was learn about audio. Learn about audio. It never hurts to know exactly what's going on here. Frequencies, uh, effects. Yes, which we spoke yeah. about earlier. Which we spoke about earlier. And uh, like I said, I think it would be good to have someone in here to talk about the basic effects. Mm. But you as a listener yeah. and, a, and a musician... Sometimes it helps to to have some idea of what frequencies are being used for each instrument. What an overtone is. What an overtone is. Very mm -hmm. important. There's a, we did an episode on that. Yep. And um, yeah, just how, how the instruments sound and uh, effects that are applied to them, reverb, stuff like that. Right, yeah. Cool to kind of know what's going on. Absolutely. Especially if you want to get into the studio at some point. Yeah, you're or, going to need to, yeah. It, the, the more you know, the, the better you can help ensure you get what you want out of a studio experience. Right. right. Or even just recording in your own home studio or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So I think that those are some pretty cool tips, uh, ear training tips for the older crowd. I, I hope that's helpful. Let us know, guys. The last thing that we're going to talk about here before we get out of here is uh, something that, to me, 
it's kind of sad, but kind of mm. kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, we I feel like many times I've heard, and you guys probably also have heard that there's a ten thousand hours rule, a ten thousand hours mastery theory. Yeah. Of sorts. In 2008, uh, nonfiction writer Malcolm Gladwell released a book called Outliers, The Story of Success. And um, it suggests, based on a longitudinal study by Anders Ericsson at Florida State University, that if you spend 10,000 hours, mm-hmm. God, I can't remember what that added. I think it was something ridiculous like three hours a day for 30 years. <laughs> something like that. Or something yeah. like that. Or six hours a day for 15 years. Whatever the <laughs> hell you can do. Either way, by the time you've done a certain act or practice that you spent 10,000 10, hours on, mm-hmm. then you are supposedly a certified, unofficially certified master. Master of that, yeah. Yeah, man. So I had heard it had been a little bit debunked. And huh. so I, I, the first thing I just looked up was 10,000 hours rule, truth or fiction kind of thing. Yep. And I found three good articles on the subject um, by some pretty good sources. One was Smithsonian. One was BBC and one was from Vox.com, all of which I will put links to on our website at musicstudent101.com. Uh-huh. And all of which suggest that perhaps the 10,000 hours rule is more of a myth than a rule. <laughs> bonk, bonk, bonk. Uh, uh. Now, like I said, at first I got excited because to me, 10,000 hours Seems like kind of an unattainable goal. Right. Especially when you're just sitting down starting off. Yep. Oh, God, I'm not going to be a master at this until I put 10,000 hours. How many <laughs> How many years is that? <laughs> but then when I started researching some of these articles, I guess you could say I felt a little better. Mm-hmm. Right? Because yeah. maybe that doesn't mean I have to spend 10,000 hours. <laughs> but more recently, this study was replicated by uh, Mega, Maitra, and Brooke McNamara at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And they did so with more a higher sample size and stricter control guidelines, stricter study control guidelines. So more data and stronger data. Mm. The more recent study suggests that uh, while practice still mattered, it only counted for 26% of the difference between the more accomplished violinist and the less accomplished violinist, where the previous study suggested that practice accounted for more like 48% of the difference between accomplished and less accomplished violinists. Huh. That seems like a pretty small number. Pretty yeah. Insignificant, as much as I hate to say. <laughs> it's not insignificant. But, you know, the 10,000 hours is not just about mu- musicianship, though. I mean, that's the mastery of any skill. Right. right? So, right, right. So, we're talking about it kind of as it applies to music here. Yeah. Um, so, they're suggesting that other factors that play a bigger role are actually age, mm-hmm. how old you are when you start whatever craft you're trying to hone, right? Uh, intelligence. Yeah. So, they say, and talent. And talent. And talent. So now, are some people born with higher levels of talent than others? I don't know. This I is... do know that some musicians have to work way less hard than I do to get good. Or did they work hard before they met you? You know... I don't know, man. Some of these people I've known for a long time. Yeah, and My friend just... Aaron McDonald was a better bass player at 20 years old than I am now. He's just that great. <laughs> He's a renaissance man. He can paint. He can take pictures. He trains dogs. He does it all, and yet can still be that great of a bass player. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting stuff. I don't know. You know, it, it has not always been consistent with my experience. Mm-hmm. Take that for what you will. To say that the the driving factor be- behind how good a musician you are is talent, quote unquote. Um, I'm actually not a big believer in talent. Yeah? I'm a believer in practice. Yeah? And I'm a believer in, in someone finding enough joy and bliss out of something like learning an instrument that it doesn't feel like work to, the, to them to commit 10,000 hours, mm-hmm. right? And, it, and it really it is that, that, that drive and that passion for it, which, you know, certainly more than any kind of natural talent and even more than the actual raw number of hours you're doing it, it is, it is actually that kind of drive and passion for something that, that is going to make you successful. Now, those things are actually also going to make you appear intelligent to an IQ test. And there's been people who have talked about IQ tests for a long time and measuring the quote-unquote intelligence of a particular person. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's an actual controversial field 
mm-hmm. it, itself and the controversial idea itself. Interesting. Yeah. And, um, you know, people who start younger just have had more time with it. But yeah. I do know that younger people, when you get to the age of 20 and so on, yeah. your brain is not as, doesn't have the same amount of plasticity. Right. And that neural true. connections aren't made as quickly and as, and as, as, as abundantly. Easily, yeah. Yeah. That, that is, that is true. That but I can is see true. age being a factor. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. But that doesn't mean that, that, uh, that older people can't do it. They may just, you know, work a little longer or, you know. A little harder to achieve the same results. But, exactly. Oh, yeah. It's know. not like you just can't learn anything after 25. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. Yeah, that's, right? <laughs> that's um, not the case. But you do have to, I think, practice more and, and study more, you know, um, put, yeah. more, put more brain cells into it, however yeah. you want to put it. Yeah. I tell you, it, once your brain cells have been committed to playing the piano or something from age seven or whatever, I'll tell you this, it's, it becomes very difficult for you to create sy- synapses going in another direction. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of the things that a lot of modernist composers uh, have have had trouble dealing with is people, you know, is asking people to play microtones or uh, play uh, serial music or, or, or play in this way that is just, you know, deliberately defined of the convention that they learned in their synapses when they were kids, you know. And it, it's palpable the pushback they get, mm. you know. So, you know, it is kind of, you're kind of trading a certain amount of, you know, uh, mental flexibility for, for uh, prowess there. Mm. You know. I, at least, at least in my experience. Now, yeah. what do I know? You know, I didn't, I didn't draw data from 11,000 research participants, but, you know. But although. I have known a lot of musicians. And a lot of students. You watch people learn all the time. That's what you do. I do. You're watching people learn. So, yeah. you're probably taking some cues from your own experiences. With your students, I'm guessing. And if my students tell me anything, what they tell me is it is the ones who truly love it that do well. Yeah. Well, by the time you by the time you choose that path in college, you, yeah, I would assume you love it that much. Well, not a lot of people's parents are saying you got to be a, uh, you know, I'll help you through college, but you got to be a music major. Well, like I said, <laughs> gray area. There's there's lots of gray area. Oh, and on that you know? note. You would think that by the time you have the passion to spend 10,000 hours on something. Let's hope you love it. Let's hope you love it. Yeah. And you'll probably pick it up a little bit faster. And enjoy I genuinely it. don't believe you could spend 10,000 hours on something you absolutely hate and just become a master at it despite your hatred of it. I just don't think that works. That's a good point. And, in, and if you came in, it's like at that last hour, you said, woo, 10,000 hours. Thank God that's over and I never have to do it again. But now I'm a master at it. Yeah. No, I, I don't think you would be a master at it. No, no, no. If you spent that whole time hating it. I really don't. I really think the passion you feel for, for something has a lot to do with how good you are at it. And I have a lot of sympathy for someone who has spent 10,000 hours doing something that they really don't enjoy. Yeah. That's bad life, man. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Well, um, this has been eye-opening for me, I think. Me too. Um, I like to think I would do some of these things, but uh, maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Well, you know, some of these things we just kind of do naturally at this point, I think. Yeah, yeah. We, we do it without calling it a thing that we're doing. Yeah. But the important thing is that we share it with you guys. Indeed. And do with it what you will. Indeed. Hope well, that has been helpful. I hope so. And we will be back soon. And we'll see you then. Keep practicing. Yes, in the meantime, practice, practice, practice. So you know what you gotta do. And now you know some efficient and cool ways to do it. So get to practicing. And keep on listening. And if you'd like to support us financially, you can do so at patreon.com slash musicstudent101. And if you have some of your own practicing tips, let us know about them at info at musicstudent101.com.